All right, so let me have your attention, and I want to, uh, without taking too much time away from the main event today, thank you all for coming. I see guests, I see friends, I see colleagues, and I see students, so it's all of which are great. Uh, we very much appreciate this. Thanks to Julie for funding the, San the Hyatt event um, and, and the important role that she plays in this and similar events. It's my great, great privilege today, briefly, to introduce to you my friend and mentor, and, and you know, I seldom throw around the phrase, but this is a great American you're going to hear from today. Um, Dave Sheffer has the, the academic pedigree, Harvard undergrad, Oxford, uh, Georgetown LLM, those are just the, the pieces of paper. Um, he has a variety of experiences, so, so there's private firm practice in Kudair Brothers, there's other private firm expertise, um, and a long litany of government service. He's currently serving in two I would say equally important capacities. One is at Northwestern Law School um, in the endowed chairs, the Mayor Brown Robert A. Hellman Professor of Law, and, and near and dear to my heart, the director of the Northwestern Law School Human Rights Clinic. Um, He's also just been recently appointed, and in fact, we're, we're very privileged that he's over his jet lag just slightly back from Cambodia. Um, Ambassador Sheffer is currently serving as a special expert to the Secretary General of the United Nations um, on assistance to the Khmer Rouge tribunals. And if you're interested in the expert inside, behind the scenes story as to the creation of the extraordinary chambers in Cambodia, it's chapter 12 of the book. Um, and it's an exceptional story. Here's what I want to tell you about David Sheffer. Uh, many of you law students came to law school and you said, I want to change the world. A lot of law students come to law school with that intention. Uh, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to make things better. Well, the hard truth is that some do and some don't. In fact, sadly, many don't. This is one who went to law school and, in fact, has changed the world as we know it, at least the legal landscape as we know it. There's a very long and distinguished record of public service and, and organizational involvement in places like the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Carnegie Foundation. Um, Council on Foreign Relations, a lot of public service institutionally and organizationally. That's all important. In terms of public service, an equally long litany, and I won't waste time giving you all the publications, suffice it to say, very distinguished, very extensive, uh, but again with that focus of writing to make a difference, writing to shed light on things that need to be enlightened, uh, to inform people that need to be informed. I think that's, that's admirable, and I would say that's the David Shepherd style. That's the approach. And he's never really tired from that. To, and in that vein, I would tell you, you have, a, you have a very difficult choice to make. It's really not a hard choice. You can either take a flyer about the book, which are being passed out, and you can order it off Amazon or Borders or whatever other sort of convenient website thing you'd like to do, or you can walk out into the lobby and order a book or pay for a book and have it signed. Either one is a good choice. I prefer to have it signed myself. Um, David will stay, uh, Ambassador Sheffer will stay after, after uh, the discussion to sign books for those who would like. Uh, the long record of public service goes back to the very, the very foundation of the international criminal justice movement in the 90s. Um, very distinguished public servant serving at the side of Madeleine Albright at the, at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations in New York. Um, then serving as the first U.S. Ambassador for, at large for war crimes. And you'll, you'll frequently find points in your career where they say, leave this place better than you found it. Right? Create a legacy. David Sheffer did that. To the extent that in, when administrations change and when politics change, there's a huge array of organizational changes in the U.S. government, but that fundamental question, does the United States need an ambassadorial level position to deal with this substance matter? Because of David Sheffer's work, that question is a no-brainer yes. The only logical question then is, ir irrespective of change of administrations or change of policies, etc., who's the right person to fill his shoes? And the answer is, very difficult to find somebody to fill his shoes. It's not an easy task. Um, he served as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes, and in that capacity has a global mandate. The events in the book describe in great detail some of the professionalism behind the scenes and, and, and the interactions in terms of negotiations and how he tries to fulfill that global mandate to do what's right for the world. Um, on a personal note, I'll tell you, as I said, this is a friend and a mentor, one whom I greatly admire. 
Life is not about what you do in so much as it's in the way you do it. You're about to hear from a distinguished public servant. I want you to listen carefully because what you'll see and what you'll hear is somebody, a distinguished public servant, that, that goes about doing great things, but he does them with a character and a class and a style that in, in many ways is unique. You're very, very privileged to be able to hear um, the inimitable David Sheffer style today. Help me, please join with me in welcoming my, my friend and, and, and mentor, David Sheffer. Wow, Professor Newton. Can I, can I get that tape and sort of just set that up everywhere I go? Thank you so much. That um, is far too generous in your comments. Uh, m many of you may not know that uh, Professor Newton um, was a JAG officer in the late 1990s, and of course even before then, uh, when I asked him to come join me in the Office of War Crimes Issues in the State Department. Uh, and uh, he and I had a couple of years of extraordinary experience together, uh, working so many different issues, both in the negotiating realm, in terms of the Kosovo conflict in 1999, and boy do I have anecdotes for you about Major Mike Newton and Kosovo, which I will not say right now. You know, we'll, you can catch me later on those. Um, but you have here um, at Vanderbilt uh, Law, and of course he sustained his work with the Office of War Crimes Issues into the Bush administration, and um, all I can say, in, in uh, this has to be a reciprocal statement that um, uh, Professor Newton himself has made an enormous impact on international justice, uh, not only with respect to the work we did in the 1990s, but also, as you know, with respect to the deliverance of justice in, in Iraq after uh, 2003, with his, and he's produced his own book to that effect. So thank you very much, Mike. Um, I am pleased to be back um, at Vanderbilt. Uh, this is my third time in, uh, in a number of years, uh, uh, over the last decade or so, and it's always a tremendous pleasure to be here, particularly in this room, uh, which is such a pleasure to uh, speak in. Um, I'm going to spend about, oh, maybe 20, 25 minutes or so talking about my book and uh, the, the foundation of it, frankly, in terms of what has happened in the last 20 years. And then um, I'd very much like to um, take your questions, because that's usually the more interesting part of the hour, is the latter half, when I can answer your questions. Um, but <clears throat> let me go back. You know, um, I think it's important to recognize that um, uh, we were confronted with an enormous challenge in the early 1990s when I had the opportunity to enter government service uh, with the Clinton administration and I was senior advisor and counsel to Madeleine Albright who had become our ambassador to the United Nations. I had a, a, a particular role with her though. I stayed back in Washington to run her Washington, or to help run her Washington office in the State Department, but also to represent her on the National Security Council. She had a cabinet position, so therefore she was a principal on the National Security Council. I was her deputy, which meant that I attended the deputies committees, which went on all the time. And it gave me an exposure to the entire breadth of foreign policy making in the first term of the Clinton administration, because I was representing the US mission to the UN and Madeleine Albright in those meetings. And then when the principals met, I would be her plus one. I would sit behind her at the principal's meeting. So I had sort of an endless, consistent, constant existence in the situation room of the White House. I think I memorized every panel in that room while I was there for four years. Um, and it gave me a very unique perspective on how policy evolved during those four years. And I write a lot about that in the book. Um, interestingly enough, um, I wrote 250,000 words for this book. And when I submitted it to Princeton University Press and to my editor there, she emailed back a few days later uh, very politely saying, thank you very much. 
uh, we will look forward to your deletion of 60,000 words uh, <laughs> so that we could have a more manageable book of 190,000 words, which is what this is, 190,000 plus, you know, that includes the footnotes. Um, and, um, but part of that 60,000 words that were cut was actually the, the dynamic of so many discussions in that situation room on major foreign policy issues, particularly the Balkans, which you know are not literally specific to the development of the war crimes tribunals, but of course provide the larger context for what the Yugoslav tribunal, in, in fact, was all about. Um, and so someday I hope to sort of resurrect those 60,000 words and, and present them to you as that sort of insight into uh, the broad range of foreign policy making in the sit room during those four years. Um, uh, now, the world that confronted us in the early 1990s um, was one of mass atrocities, leadership perpetrators, usually an ongoing and vicious armed conflict, or at least a potentially resurgent one, a destroyed or failed court system, unwilling political leaders, a skeptical international community much more focused on the peace or war equation of the conflict itself than on justice. That was the scenario facing us in so many atrocity zones, including in the Balkans, in Rwanda, in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Cambodia was different, only in that the atrocities had long ended. They occurred during the 1970s under Pol Pot. But the infrastructure was lacking and political landmines were all over the place in Cambodia. We were not starting from scratch because of the Nuremberg and Tokyo military uh, tribunals decades earlier and the precedents they had established. But ours was a very different challenge under far more complex circumstances. This would not be victor's justice, although some have viewed it as the powerful imposing justice upon the weak. And by that I mean we were building, in this book, describes the building of five uh, criminal tribunals, the Permanent International Criminal Court, the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and the Extraordinary Chambers uh, in the courts of Cambodia. But modern international justice is no simple code of criminal procedure either. The quest for justice meanders back and forth between international and domestic courts, and it gets very complex. Yet the search for evil aimed for the civility of the courtroom, and in the growing resolve that removing war criminals from politics and military leadership indeed would make a difference. We have witnessed a transformational error in confronting what I call atrocity crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And by the way, let me just pause on that for a moment. Since I'm in a law school setting, I should say this. Uh, um, there's a postscript chapter to this book that tries to explain what do I mean by atrocity crimes and what do I mean by the term atrocity law. During my experience uh, in government during those eight years, dealing not only with policymakers but with journalists, uh, with the general public very often, um, it becomes a very tedious exercise and quite frankly I think a debilitating one to either incorrectly say, oh, we're talking about war crimes, when in fact you're talking about genocide, or we're talking about crimes against humanity, when in fact you're talking about war crimes, uh, or to simply sit there and say constantly, you know, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, you, you, you know, the journalist falls asleep after 10 seconds. So it, it was very, and the policymaker says, what, what well, you know, what's all this, I don't know what all these crimes really mean. Uh, and by the way, because I can't, let's not decide what the policy is today. Uh, uh, you know, think of Rwanda in that context. Think of Srebrenica in that context. So it wasn't until I left government in 2001 when I was at the U.S. Institute of Peace for a year, as, as Professor Newton noted, that I actually sat down and of course started writing my law review articles as a good future law professor would do. Um, and I sort of started to develop this concept of let's, let's look at the terminology of international justice that we're using today and let's make sure that we get it right. Let's be accurate. 
And in order to be accurate, we actually have to develop a couple of general terms. Because if we don't, we're actually inaccurate. If you have a Security Council resolution that says we're just looking at violations, you know, it's, it's imperative for the world community or the international community to address the violations of international humanitarian law in such and such a region. Well, actually, that's inaccurate. It's not just international humanitarian law, which is on deck. That's a law that applies for the protection of civilians during armed conflict. We need to be much more expansive in our notion of crimes against humanity that don't necessarily occur during armed conflict, genocide that doesn't necessarily occur during armed conflict, and there are even law of war principles which don't tightly fit into international humanitarian law, but rather into the law of war that you better be concerned about uh, when you're looking at war crimes. And so it gets to be a, a very inaccurate configuration. Um, and uh, in the postscript to the book, I didn't want to, you know, burden you up front with the book. This is the postscript is really for law students and faculty and and other interested people, including the general public, who want to sort of get this right. Um, I describe, you know, why why not use the term atrocity crimes uh, to describe that 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 grouping of crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. It's a lot easier for me as a policymaker to go into my boss, let's say Ambassador or Secretary of State Albright, and say, um, Madam Secretary, we have a situation of atrocity crimes unfolding today in such and such region of the world. It merits an effective response by the US government. No, we're not going to get bogged down on whether it's genocide or crimes against Japan. Judges will figure that out. Prosecutors and defense counsel will argue those issues, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, the issue of intent under criminal law, which applies when you're trying to understand these crimes. That's not the issue today. The issue is we know that that kind of violence is occurring on the ground. You can go out to the press and to your other colleagues in the cabinet and say it's atrocity crimes. Now the issue is how do we respond to it? How do we effectively repel this violence against individuals? Um, and then in terms of atrocity law, it just seems to me it's a much more accurate concept as to what is actually flowing from the jurisprudence of all of these war crimes tribunals now. They're not just delivering judgments in international humanitarian law, or in the law of war, or in international human rights law. And while technically you can keep it within the framework of international criminal law, International criminal law is a very expansive field of law that goes way beyond atrocity crimes into money laundering, drug trafficking, terrorism, etc. So it's a little misleading to say, oh, today we're, we're looking at judgments in international criminal law. It doesn't really help you get to the focus of what the tribunals are doing. Anyway, that's the postscript chapter, and since this is a law school audience, I wanted to tell you about that um, so that you can take a look at that at the back of the book. Um, all right, I sometimes like to talk about this subject in terms of the old world and the new world. The old world, of course, was before 1993 when we arrived in office at the Clinton administration. And what did the old world look like at that point? Well, first, we had no international criminal courts. The last ones had been Nuremberg and Tokyo uh, right after World War II. And quite frankly, they were fading from memory. They were the province of a few uh, very dedicated academics uh, and military lawyers who, of course, had to know what was going on back then. But it wasn't as if it was a common currency in the legal academy uh, or in the political academy as to trying to revive Nuremberg and, and Tokyo into some modern system of justice. Um, we also had a, a world where there was official leadership impunity. Uh, between the World War II and, um, and the, the end of the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials and uh, 1993, it really was not a common, it, there was no presumption that leaders would be held accountable for atrocity crimes. Uh, head of state immunity and other immunities in international law were just churning forward in full force and effect. 
And frankly, that influenced policy making because policymakers could sit there and say, well, I'm sorry, he's the head of state or he's the top general in that country. Uh, you know, we're not going to, this isn't a discussion about holding them accountable for what they've done. It's a discussion about achieving peace and stability in the region. I'll never forget the very first days of the Clinton administration. I spent a lot of time in crisis meetings in the State Department on Haiti. We were under siege by refugees coming from Haiti and there was a real crisis that had to be dealt with there. And we were talking a lot about General Cedros at that time, the leader of Haiti, and, um, and his very, very abusive leadership. And no one at the table was saying, oh, okay, now let's bring General Sados to, to justice. Uh, you know, of course he must stand trial. Uh, that was not the context of the discussion at all. It was frankly, what Panamanian villa do we, you know, fly General Sados off to so that he can live happily and in comfort and get him out of there? Um, and of course, that's ultimately what happened in 1994. In the summer of 94, General Sados got on a plane and he lives in a villa uh, on the seashore in Panama. So um, you can argue the merits of doing it that way, but I'll, all I'm saying is that in 1993, the old world held sway in the policy room that we're not talking about bringing someone like General Cedros to justice. Um, and of course, that was true for so many other leaders in the old world, whether it be Pol Pot, Stalin, Idi Amin, Duvalier, Hafez al-Assad. I hope I get a question on Syria. Uh, Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania, Mengistu of Ethiopia, Sukarno Suharto, Indonesia, King Kim Il-sung in North Korea, Joseph Savimbi in Angola, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, and he's still with us. Um, all right, we also poorly understood atrocity crimes. We actually, you know, we didn't really know much about prosecuting genocide. Uh, it was not really a charge at Nuremberg at Tokyo. It was, it was folded in within the complex of crimes against humanity. Um, we had the Genocide Convention, but it had never been truly enforced. So this whole idea that a prosecutor would walk into a courtroom and actually know how to prosecute the crime of genocide, we didn't know that in 93. We didn't know how to do that. Uh, we had no real experience prosecuting genocide. Um, crimes against humanity, neither did we not only not have experience prosecuting it, we really didn't know what they meant. We had this list from Nuremberg and Tokyo of crimes against humanity and some experience in those trials, but beyond that, there was a whole new world to discover in terms of what the individual specified crimes against humanity actually met, what were their definitions, how do you prosecute them, uh, what's the evidence required for them. Uh, all of that was yet to be discovered. This was all new in 1993 as we started to build the Yugoslav Tribunal. And finally, war crimes. We certainly had our experience much longer with the codification and the Hague regulations and the various Geneva Conventions in the practice of certain court martials during the years. But if you were to, to ask anyone in 1993, uh, please provide me with a very coherent understanding of the list of war crimes and frankly all of the elements of those crimes and how to prosecute them effectively, you could not get there in 1993. It was still very much a, a, uh, an emerging practice with respect to war crimes. All right, and certainly there have been no international prosecutions of them since Nuremberg and Tokyo. All right, we, we had weak national enforcement and domestic systems. I won't go bore you with the details, but it was, it was weak uh, with regard to atrocity crimes. And finally, we had no experienced body of international jurists. I mean, think of it, 1993, do you think that I could sit at my desk in the State Department and I was under instruction from Ambassador Albright, create the list, along with my colleagues in the legal advisor's office, um, create the list of jurists who were going to put on the bench of the Yugoslav Tribunal, or, uh, and also who were gonna look to to be the prosecutor of the Yugoslav Tribunal uh, in The Hague. Um, do, do you think we had some general list we could look to? No, we had to sit there and dream it up. We asked embassies, our embassies around the world, uh, do you know of any international, uh, any jurists in your countries who actually know something about international law and ideally actually know something about international criminal law? That would be great. Could we have those names, please? Um, and 
uh, even in the United States, uh, uh, Ambassador Albright said to me, look, David, there has not been a single woman on the bench of the International Court of Justice in its entire history, including its years as permanent court of international justice. Not a single woman has sat on that bench. This year, we will break that mold. In other words, we will put a woman, an American woman, on the bench of the Yugoslav Tribunal. So you know what sort of names I want to see in front of me. <laughs> you know, don't bring me all the men. Bring me some women to look at. And, um, and I found one in Houston, Texas, federal court judge Gabriel McDonald, very, very experienced seasoned judge in that courtroom, fantastic with criminal law, but no international law experience. So we just went ahead anyway. I remember having her in my office in the State Department before she went off to The Hague. And I, I you know, gave her a few textbooks on international law, one on international criminal law, sort of pointed out various chapters and said, you know, you, you got to read this stuff before you, you get going in, in uh, The Hague. And she was a very fast reader, very fast learner, I should say. And of course, she rose to be a distinguished judge and ultimately president of the Yugoslav Tribunal. But it just is emblematic of, of the situation that confronted us at the time. Uh, the prosecutor we selected for the Yugoslav Tribunal, uh, ultimately, um, uh, it took 14 months to find one. Uh, Richard Goldstone in South Africa, and my book tells the story of, uh, and it's far too short, that's part of the 60,000 words, I cut out all reams of anecdotes about the hunt for a prosecutor of the Yugoslav Tribunal, uh, and so I condensed it. Um, but um, it was a long journey of 14 months, uh, and many people couldn't understand, why isn't there a prosecutor today, you know, at the Yugoslav Tribunal? Why are we delaying? And um, there are reasons, you know, why it was so difficult to find exactly the right person to, to prosecute the, uh, before the Yugoslav Tribunal. Our first candidate from the United, uh, the United States, uh, the first candidate we put forward for prosecutor uh, 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 was uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo of Argentina, who has been the prosecutor of the ICC for the last decade. But back in 93, we knew him to be the prosecutor of the dirty war in Argentina, and he had done a very good job at that. And um, we wanted to put his name forward for the Yugoslav Tribunal, and we were uh, surprised, uh, but not amazed, um, when the Argentine government uh, uh, sent us negative signals. And of course, if, if a candidate's own government sends those negative signals, you, you basically have lost the battle at that point. You can't go forward at the UN. And um, there are reasons why those signals were sent, which I write about in the book. Um, but I think it's sort of the irony of history that our favorite candidate at that time was Luis Moreno Campo, and then uh, 10 years later, he's the chief prosecutor of the International uh, Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, Okay, what's the new world, 1993 onwards? Well, first, we, we do have lots of international criminal courts now, as well as internationalized domestic courts of criminal character, uh, criminal law application. Um, and that's, this book is, is really the story about building five of them, as I've noted, uh, and negotiating them. But I, I want to say, uh, just spend a couple of minutes to, to tell you that there's, there's a story that's not in the book that was very dominant through that period. Um, you know, we built UN courts in East Timor and in Kosovo, um, and uh, uh, we also failed, uh, and I spent an enormous amount of my time on these matters, we failed to, to find vehicles of accountability for what had happened in Sudan over a 17, 18 year civil war of enormous devastating character. And I, I was in Sudan, I flew in without the permission of Khartoum, you know, on a UNICEF plane into South Sudan and ran around for a week or so. 
uh, looking at the atrocities there um, and and tried my best to to try to find some vehicle of accountability and that never succeeded a lot of time I spent in the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and we never were able to, to build the right tribunal uh, for that country and the massive death and destruction in the Congo during the 1990s Burundi genocide 1993 we got so far as to to succeed in building a UN Commission of Experts that ultimately decided genocide had occurred in Burundi in 93, but we couldn't get it the next step to an international criminal tribunal. So another failure in terms of finding accountability. Iraq under Saddam Hussein in the 1980s and 1990s, an enormous amount of my time was spent trying to build an international criminal tribunal to investigate and hopefully indict Saddam Hussein and his colleagues, even while they're in office uh, and holding power in Iraq. And that's a very long story, back and forth to the Security Council, never quite succeeding to get the right votes, you know, with Russia and China and even France sometimes expressing their doubts. I do wonder what, what, you know, this is one of these great what if chapters. You know, I love these what if books. What if we had actually built a international criminal tribunal to deal with the atrocities of the 80s and 90s in Iraq? Um, indicted Saddam Hussein, isolated him, delegitimized him and his colleagues, and then arrives 2003 in the George W. Bush administration, and I just wonder what the dynamic would have been if he had, if Saddam Hussein had already been under this vast cloud of, of, of indictment and delegitimization at that point, what would have been the dynamic in terms of actually going into Iraq and for what purpose and why and all of these things. Um, Professor Newton, of course, picks it up in the last decade uh, with all of his work on the Saddam Hussein trial uh, and the trial, the Anfal trial and, and others, uh, which were in the aftermath of the intervention. But it's kind of an interesting story of our failure in the 90s to actually achieve an accountability mechanism for Iraq. And then finally, Chechnya. Uh, some of you will, will recall how devastating the violence and, and atrocities were in Chechnya uh, uh, in, in the late 1990s. I saw an enormous amount of evidence as ambassador at large for war crimes issues. This is where the Pentagon would come over and just dump all of this data in front of us, which was uh, incredibly uh, serious, uh, makes one ponder where accountability resides for those atrocities. But you can just imagine, uh, uh, imagine me walking down the hallways of the State Department on my way to the Russia desk to talk about accountability for Chechnya. And uh, the last thing the Russia desk wants to do is to complicate its life by going after the Moscow leadership for you know, atrocity crimes in Chechnya. So uh, again, sort of a futile effort, but nonetheless, I think it's important to recognize that it's there. Now, we did begin to see in the new world the, the end of uh, impunity. I'm going to end up, uh, finish very quickly here. Um, the end of leadership of impunity, uh, it's not over yet, of course, but uh, we had so many different leaders actually arrive at the bar of justice before these international uh, criminal tribunals. Um, sophisticated atrocity crimes, we now know so much more about the meaning of the atrocity crimes, how to prosecute them. We have new crimes against humanity like forced pregnancy and forced marriage. Uh, we, we have a much better understanding of what the crime of persecution means in terms of ethnic cleansing and how to prosecute it and investigate it. Uh, and even on the crime of torture, the tribunals have, have uh, had considerable jurisprudence on this, which I think could have better informed uh, certain Justice Department lawyers in the early part of the last decade as to what, what are we talking about when we're talking about torture. Um, okay, now what I'd like to do um, is um, kind of finish these remarks by saying in the book itself you have various chapters that really talk about negotiating the creation of international criminal tribunals and how complicated it is, all the political and other forces that come to bear uh, in these exercises, uh, which I sort of had, was deeply immersed in. Um, and I think that's just a good narrative. It's a good diplomatic history to read. Um, 
But there are also chapters in the book about, for example, one is about the Rwanda genocide and what was happening back in Washington and not happening back in Washington during those critical months in 1994. Uh, there's another chapter about the Srebrenica genocide in 95 and what was happening and not happening back in Washington during those, that critical summer of 1995 prior to the Dayton Peace Accords. All with the hope of explaining uh, the, the essence of U.S. decision making during those t uh, times. There's a chapter entitled Unbearable Timidity about the five-year hunt uh, uh, anemic at times uh, uh, for Radovan Karadzic and Rocco Mladic in the Balkans as indicted uh, fugitives from the justice of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And it, it's a chapter that really tells you the frustrating time I had for five years trying to galvanize all of the different parts of the U.S. bureaucracy and of key foreign governments to actually focus like a laser on taking these guys down down and bringing them to The Hague. Um, as you know, it ultimately happened with uh, Karadzic in 2008 and with Mladic uh, in 2010, but, or was it 2011? can't remember now. Is it 2011 now? Great. Okay. Um, and so that finally happened, but my book tells the story of five years of futility in that effort. Um, and there's three chapters on the negotiations for the International Criminal Court, before Rome, during Rome, and after Rome, uh, that I think you'll find interesting. And finally, in the Cambodia chapter, I think you'll read something you've never seen before, uh, which is our, our hunt for Pol Pot in the jungles of Cambodia. We were actually very prepared to capture him, fly him out of Cambodia, and, and bring him to justice in a very, very interesting way, and the book tells you that story. Um, and it's really, as, as so much of the book, you know, this book is drawn from eight years of very detailed note-taking that I took. Uh, so it's very raw stuff that you see, uh, as well as declassified State Department cables. So I think you really do get a, a pretty good sense of the inside story uh, of this of this uh, event. Now. I know that one o'clock is my, my cutoff time, but I, I would love to read just a couple of short passages. Mike, do I have the privilege of doing that? Okay. A lot of people ask me about my relationship with Madeleine Albright for eight years. Um, she was the most powerful woman in the world for eight years. There's, that's a fact. She was the most powerful woman. So working for her was a privilege, an honor, a challenging. Uh, I always had to be on my toes. Uh, just uh, working very, very hard. Uh, she was demanding, and I thrived on it. And she gave me the opportunity to, to really surge forward in the field of atrocity crime, so I owe her everything. Um, and I was with her from the first day of the Clinton administration to the very, very last day. I was, I was her first hire. So um, she and I had an extraordinary experience, and this book, uh, tells a lot about that experience, but it also tells you where we had our disagreements, a couple of setbacks between the two of us, and, and you know, when I sat down in 2001 after the Clinton administration, I actually started to write this book and I found it was awful. My writing was just terrible. I said, who, who the hell would want to read this? Um, why? Because I was, I was being so defensive about everything. And that's what happens immediately after you leave office. You're very defensive. You've lost the election. You hate the other party. You know, blah, blah, blah. And that is a terrible time to write the book. So I just put it aside. And, and, and in 2007, I actually got a call from Princeton University Press. And they said, well, isn't it time you write your book? And I said, oh, oh, okay, well maybe I should do that now. And it was, a, it was just the right time because I, I, had, I, I could be self-critical, I could look back with perspective, I'd read what some other people had written, obviously, about those years, uh, and, and how they were bringing out things that I needed to know, frankly, about those years, their perspectives. Um, and that included uh, uh, Madeleine Albright's book. And so um, it really was the right time. And so I hope what you see in this book is a very honest rendering of what happened during those years. All right, I'm going on and on. Here's one paragraph. Albright displayed great cunning in her public service, and she brilliantly mastered both the Washington bureaucracy and the UN behemoth in New York. 
I marveled at how she could coax the most obstinate opponent into conceding vital points while pitching over the cliff those who dared to presume that she, a woman in a man's world of diplomacy, had a weak spine. Some of my most enjoyable moments were when I played a bit part in her theater of misperceptions. During my early years with Albright, I would witness a group of men, and typically only men, enter her office at the State Department in Washington and plop down on comfortable couches for a policy meeting with her, while I sat on one of the hardback chairs to take notes and occasionally contribute a few words. Ambassador Albright would rise from her desk, greet the gentlemen, and ask if they wanted coffee. Invariably, some of the men would say yes, please, and expect Albright to sit down with them and have either her secretary or me serve the coffee. But Albright strode over to a side table, slowly poured the coffee, and brought each cup, one at a time, to the anointed men. Our first test was to see whether anyone objected to the US permanent representative to the United Nations personally serving him coffee. Sometimes the men simply thanked her. The second test was to wait for one of the kind men to object and offer to help carry the coffee cups. But she would stop the poor soul and say cheerfully to the entire group, oh please don't bother. You know, I used to do this for a living when I was a housewife. From that moment forward, Madeleine Albright controlled the meeting as the men sunk a bit lower in those soft couches. Now let me take one, one final passage and then I'm done, okay? This is pages 196 to 197, just before I go off to Rome to, to, for the final negotiations on the Rome Statute, summer of 1998. Um, I, I, uh, Madeleine Albright and I, she was Secretary of State, we wanted to get a change in my instructions. We had gridlock in the Principals Committee of the National Security Council. I, we needed to go to the President. I called the Chief of Staff, asked for a meeting with the President. Um, he was busy preparing for China, and frankly, it was also the Monica Lewinsky summer. It was just all hell had broken loose. So um, uh, they suggested, well, well, could you meet with the First Lady, Hillary Clinton? And I knew her. I had great conversations with her in the past because she and Madeline are close friends. So, uh, of course I said, of course I'd meet with the First Lady, and then she could convey words to the President. She's not in the chain of command, but that's, that's where we were that summer. So, um, uh, it's early June 1998, and I walk over to the White House. <laughs> But on that day in June 1998, Hillary uh, entered the map room of the White House with Milan Verveer, her chief of staff. Eric Schwartz of the National Security Council, Jamie Baker, the lawyer at the J Security Council, and one of his um, deputy lawyers, and I took our assigned seats on the couch and assorted chairs. Hillary appeared tired and drawn, as if she had been through some kind of hell and back. I worried what that might mean for the sake of our discussion. But I plunged ahead, explaining precisely what um, Albright had set forth in the late May teleconference as the shift we needed in the U.S. negotiating position. Baker then weighed in with the Pentagon's view to hold firm on the long-standing American requirements. Hillary asked how the negotiations had gotten so convoluted with such complexities over jurisdiction. Why not, she asked, just have a global war crimes tribunal modeled on the Yugoslav tribunal, which was created by the Security Council. When this all got started, she thought we would simply reproduce the Yugoslav tribunal on a world stage. I explained why the International Criminal Court would be a treaty-based court, independent of the United Nations, and that after years of negotiations, the situation had changed as governments expressed their largely negative views about the Security Council controlling a judicial process. Hillary expressed her amazement that the French did not find the International Criminal Court abhorrent given that country's involvement in Africa and the exposure of their forces there. I explained that France was one of the most engaged governments in the negotiations and saw this as a means to lead in Europe and in the realm of international justice. I also knew that they were likely to sign the Rome Statute, perhaps even at the conclusion of the diplomatic conference, and they did. She absorbed without flinching Baker's condescending warning that since the president finally understood the role of the military, if he were to support the Pentagon position, President Clinton would earn the military's permanent respect and allegiance. Off brief here, I will simply tell you, I thought that was supposed to have occurred on January 20th, 1993, when he was sworn in. Um, 
And that meant that he, President Clinton, needed to back the current U.S. insistence on full immunity from prosecution by the court as both a non-party state and as a possible future state party to the court. In rebuttal, I reminded her of the futility of trying to attain full immunity that would extend even to our status as a state party and that it was undercutting our credibility to achieve major objectives in the treaty. Hillary paused to reflect, thanked us, and told me she sympathized with how difficult my job would be in Rome. I saw that as a signal that she would advise the president to back the Pentagon's futile position, and that is exactly what he did. So that concludes my monologue, and I'd love to take some questions now. Yes. Right. Uh, he asked, what would it take to actually bring American leadership before an international criminal tribunal, right? Um, well, first, technically, we are subject to the jurisdiction completely of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia with respect to any military action that we take on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and that is action we did take in 1999. Our air power, joined with other NATO countries, uh, uh, was used uh, with respect to targets in Kosovo and in Serbia. That's all part of the former Yugoslavia. And we actually came under investigation, or no, I should say preliminary review, by uh, the prosecutor's office of the Yugoslav Tribunal as to the character of the NATO bombing campaign over Kosovo and Serbia to ensure, you know, to, to determine whether or not we were violating the laws of war uh, in, in, uh, in, in committing war crimes in our, in our uh, targeting decisions. When I, uh, when this uh, uh, preliminary review, which is usually secret within a uh, prosecutor's office, was made known through a uh, rather inadvertent uh, statement by the prosecutor to a journalist uh, that, in fact, this was being reviewed, um, uh, the news got back very fast to Washington. This was Christmas 1999. Um, and I was spending a few days, you know, with my family for Christmas at the in-laws. And um, this news suddenly erupted. Uh, Sandy Berger, the National Security uh, Advisor, went berserk. You know, how dare this the United States be subject to the jurisdiction of the U Yugoslav Tribunal? I had to fly back to Washington, kind of take him piece by piece off of his ceiling and, um, and sit down and talk with him and tell him, you know, well, we were aware that we were under review. That's normal, you know. Anyone can claim that we should be under review and the prosecutor takes a look at the evidence, etc. But yeah, this is a Security Council tribunal. We're subject to the jurisdiction of it if we use military force on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. And it was over a series of months, and I believe, Professor Newton, you were involved with me in, in working this issue. Um, we had to work very closely with the Pentagon and with NATO to literally answer all of the questions posed by the prosecutor as to the targeting decisions, as to the legitimacy of, there were like about 24, 25 key hits that were raised as, as questionable hits uh, on the bombing runs. We actually due diligently went through every one of them. We explained, you know, how the decision was made. Uh, and uh, uh, we were never, uh, there was no official investigation, uh, there was determination was made that um, there would be no official investigation of NATO and of the various governments of NATO because, frankly, the bombing campaign withstood uh, severe scrutiny uh, with respect to any violation of, of, uh, of the laws of war. Um, so it just shows you as an example that uh, that experience, first sort of dealing with political leaders who said, oh, how dare you question my judgment? 
and then saying, well, no, wait a minute, you know, have confidence in the decisions you've made. We, uh, I, I went over to the Pentagon, I was incredibly impressed with how targeting decisions were being made in Kosovo. It was a very rigorous process with JAG officers running all around the tables at all times, asking questions um, to the annoyance, frankly, of, of their military uh, colleagues, you know, who said, you know, please, would you stop asking so many questions, Mr. JAG officer? But it was a very rigorous process. And um, I think we should have confidence in that. Why are we so intimidated by this prospect? Now, when it comes to the International Criminal Court, um, uh, you know, this was a constant issue, about 24-7 for me, uh, for, for eight years. The exposure of the United States to the possibility of investigation and prosecution by the International Criminal Court. We built a system into the statute whereby if you simply strengthen your own federal, uh, your own criminal code and your military justice codes to absorb these crimes and enable you to investigate and prosecute them, and then you say you actually will do it if, if suspicions arise as to the performance of your own leaders uh, in this respect, um, then the ICC backs off. Now, if the United States wants a free ride to say, oh, no, no, well, you know, we're not going to question what our leaders do. That's off deck. Um, they, you know, we're, we're never going to hold them accountable. Even our, under our own federal criminal code and our code of military justice, they're not accountable. Then I say we've got a problem because it's frankly compliance with our own law that we're talking about here. Forget the ICC. It's our own criminal code, Title 18. It's our uniform code of military justice. Are we going to stand up and be held accountable under those documents or not? And, and if we modernize those documents, then frankly, the, uh, the way we drafted the Rome Statute is uh, our own investigation and, and if merited prosecutions will be respected. The United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, all of, all of our allies are party to the court now with the exception of Turkey and Israel and they're all modernizing their codes. I'll never forget on the day, the last day of the Rome negotiations, the French negotiator came to me and he said, Dave, okay, end of the long road with you here. I just want you to know that we're going to sign the Rome Statute tomorrow, you know, um, and the reason we're going to do it is that we are, are guaranteeing that no Frenchman will ever, ever stand trial before the ICC. It will never happen. Why? Because we're modernizing everything in our criminal code to ensure it never will. And that's why we have confidence to sign this treaty. Speak like class is at one. The plan is there are books outside. Ambassador Shepard will stay to answer questions. He's very gracious in this. Let me say one thing that he won't say, but I can which is to say that this book is a very candid portrayal uh, of, of the personal courage displayed in many situations. I'll never forget being at the Kosovo border with Ambassador Dave Sheffer, who literally was not just fighting the battles in Washington, but had the personal courage to go into places like the Kivus and, and Kosovo and other places. That's the story of this book. That's the kind of kind of character that's here. Uh, so, so if you're here and you have time, take time to ask him questions. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to thank you very much. Thank you.